Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the 2021 Biomed Boston event. We're glad you're back with us. I'd like to get our next session started off. Uh, we have a great panel discussion today on the topic of wearable sensors and digital therapeutics. I think you'll find it very interesting. I'd like to just briefly introduce our panel moderator, Bill Benton, who's the Director of Solutions for S3 Connected Health. And if you would please help me welcome Bill. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Um, I'm a participant as much as a moderator, so I'm going to sit here in the easy chair and, and talk with uh, uh, my, my colleagues here as we go through this. But first, a little introduction. Uh, my name is Bill Batten, and as Lori said, we're going to be here talking about wearable sensors and digital therapeutics. And, and we'll go through some examples and uh, hopefully educate you a little bit on that. Um, a little bit of my background, I'm a physicist and electrical engineer, uh, 40 years plus developing products ranging from heart-lung machines to hearing aids to wearable devices, a little bit of everything in between on the, both the OEM side as well as on product services side. So I've, I've been around this business for a long time. My first work in telemedicine, and I'll touch on that in a little bit, uh, is, was in the late 80s, early 90s. So uh, the time for connected health was is really right now. With me is Dr. Stephen LaBeouf uh, from uh, founder of uh, Valencell, uh, and he'll give you more background on, on, on himself here in a, a couple moments, and uh, Dr. John Foreman, who is the director of the Boston Medical uh, Center's uh, Hypertension Center. So uh, we've got kind of a good mixture here of, of uh, a longtime techie and myself, a uh, company uh, with, with LaBeouf, who has uh, done a lot of hardware development has some very interesting products to talk about. And then we have the clinical expertise in, in, in Dr. Foreman. So I'm going to give you a really quick overview of, of remote monitoring as, as we set up this conversation. Um, in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of effort starting up in, in what was called a standard around DICOM, and it really was focused on imaging. And I was lucky enough to participate in that and beam images back off an aircraft carrier to Bethesda and Walter Reed. And, and so when I look at it, say, you know, that was great. We were sending uh, big images back to a um, known medical center, and we had million-dollar CTs and a lot of government money to do it. Fast forward to where we are today, and you can send an image anywhere in the world uh, quickly and nobody reads film anymore. In the mid 2000s, fast forward 15 years later, we're thinking this should be all done. And uh, I led product development at a company called Nanan and we built the first continuous certified Bluetooth pulse oximeter that was uh, certified and connectable. So that was roughly 12, 13 years ago. And you thought, great, we're here now. We've got a few hundred dollar devices and we have consumer technology and connected medicine is still here. Uh, it is finally here. And now 15 years later, we're still having a conversation and telemedicine is now Zoom for doctors and patients uh, prompted by last year's uh, pandemic. And we'll talk more about that and the very positive impact it had, but we're still a ways away from realizing the promise of connected devices, monitoring chronic diseases and illnesses and, and, and helping prevent them in some cases. And we're gonna touch on all of that today. Um, we're going to talk specifically about hypertension uh, and, and how the devices can be used to monitor chronic illnesses such as that. Uh, hypertension, by way of a little background information, uh, there are over half a million deaths a year associated with hypertension in the United States. Half of the adults in the United States uh, can be accused of suffering from hypertension. A quarter of those uh, are perhaps under control, taking some sort of medicine, and, and, and John will talk a little bit more about that. And it costs our economy $131 billion a year at least. So with all of that as a little bit of background, um, we're gonna talk to you about digital therapeutics, what they are. We're gonna talk about chronic disease management and hypertension specifically. We're gonna give you a case study from each of our experiences on, on how monitoring devices and remote monitoring can come together to help uh, uh, deal with things like hypertension. We're gonna talk about some of the analytics that go with that, the barriers, why aren't we any further along than, than, than we are today, and finally leave you with some key takeaways. We should have plenty of time for questions as well, so we're gonna talk for a little bit and have a chat, and then uh, we look forward 
forward to taking your questions at the end of this, and uh, we'll certainly be available for some personal conversations, I'm sure, afterwards. Oh, I got to talk about my personal life? Uh, well, that could be a little dangerous, and and I'll, I'll say in advance, I've known uh, Dr. LaBeouf for quite some time, and he likes going by his last name, so I'm, it's not a sign of disrespect when I call him by his last name. So, uh, LaBeouf, I'm going to turn it over to you. Give us a little background on, on yourself, uh, what Valencell does, and a few thoughts on the topic we're going to tackle today. All right. Thanks. So my name is Dr. Stephen LaBeouf. I'm one of the founders and the president of Valence Cell. My background really is in corporate science of all different sorts. And Valence Cell is a really interesting company in this space because we don't make our own wearable devices. We make sense of technology that goes in those devices. And there's a number of different partners we have that make wearable devices products with our core technology and in our core technology our big claim to fame was we were the first to make wearable heart rate monitoring with optical devices really work for real life real life live and daily living and exercise and we provide that to the marketplace but our big innovation that we we've been discussing over here at our booth is the blood pressure technology where we can provide with this optical sense of technology and machine learning real true cuff like accuracy with finger photoplasmography and, and so one of the in, in this particular panel, a lot of what we have to, to emphasize is focusing on the use case and also how it integrates within the clinical workflow. And as you can see, he's uh, a bundle of energy, so uh, brings a level, new level of excitement. And I do not use cocaine. Yeah. Imagine <laughs> if I did. Uh, Dr. Foreman, could you give us a little background, too, and uh, talk about your interest in this space? Sure. So um, my name is John Foreman. I wear a variety of hats. Uh, one is I'm the senior deputy editor for nephrology and hypertension at UpToDate, which is a clinical decision support tool used by clinicians throughout the world. Um, another hat is as a researcher at Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston and at Boston Medical Center, where I've been conducting research studies primarily in hypertension for the past 20 years or so. And then uh, finally, as a clinician, I work at Boston Medical Center, where I'm the director of the uh, Comprehensive Hypertension Center. It's a multidisciplinary uh, center to help um, you know, the community at Boston Medical Center manage difficult cases of hypertension, including secondary hypertension and resistant hypertension. So I'm very interested in this and in wearable technology for measuring blood pressure because um, blood pressure, and you, you know, you understand from what you just heard how um, serious hypertension is and how common it is, but despite that, um, blood pressure is probably the one clinical measurement that's the most common and most important that we regularly measure in the wrong way in clinical practice. So, you know, how many times have you gone to your clinician's office, walked in from the waiting room, sat down on the table uh, with your feet dangling, having a conversation with the person taking your blood pressure, have the cuff put on your sleeve, have it pumped up and then drop down over a course of five seconds and being told, Oh, your blood pressure is 120 over 80. Well, I can pretty much guarantee you that your blood pressure is not 120 over 80 when it's measured like that. And there's so much variability. What we are going for is now out-of-office blood pressures, and that's what we want. But there are many, many barriers to out-of-office blood pressures, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into. But anyway, this is, I think there's a lot of potential for wearable technology in, this, in hypertension. I like that. The right measurement in the wrong way. That's a, it must have been the right biometric, but measured the wrong way. <laughs> For those of us who remember that old song, right? So uh, to start with, let's talk about what digital therapeutics really are, uh, because you could tell that things have been changing and evolving. Everybody knows a med device is. It's something that, that basically will diagnose, treat, or prevent uh, an illness, and we've all grown up with that. Now you have software as a medical device. You have e-health. You have m-health. You have digital health. You have all these things that, that cross over from consumer devices to, to real wearables. There, there is a formal definition of what de digital therapeutics are, and I'm going to repeat it here, and then we're going to talk about the reality. Digital therapeutics are products that deliver evidence-based therapeutic interventions. I always learned you're not supposed to define something by using the same word over, but it's a therapeutic <laughs> intervention to patients driven by high-quality software that to prevent, manage, or treat illnesses. And it's predicted to be a $9 billion market by 2025 by some folks. So that's a fancy way of saying it's using software 
to do what med devices do, only not necessarily with the underlying uh, um, hardware. And in many cases, you're starting to see it first used in changing behavior for uh, psychiatric problems and issues and, and that sort of thing. So it's um, clinical therapeutics are really device are really software driven to support medical uh, a analytics and, and decisions about what's going on with the patient. So with that as a background, how do devices like this relate to um, the practice of, of chronic disease management? And John, we'll start with you. You touched on it a little bit. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit about how you see these devices really being useful and where you'd go with them. So um, <clears throat> I think these devices could be used for a lot of um, clinical decision making that we if, if, if that we're making right now. So for example, in, um, in with what I do, uh, we're talking about home blood pressure cuffs and 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure cuffs, cuff-based technology that's used out of the office. And these are what we're primarily using to in the hypertension clinic to monitor people's blood pressure. This is not something that's available to everybody. 24-hour um, ambulatory cuffs, for example, are very hard to come by and can't be ordered. But um, we're using these devices out of office to manage blood pressure routinely. And I know that, um, sorry, you um, Keep going. I think there's other potential applications for using um, sensors that don't just measure blood pressure, but also heart rate, uh, heart rhythm, oxygen saturation, temperature, other things that could be used to increase or to better uh, risk predict cardi for cardiovascular disease and also potentially anticipate uh, cardiovascular disease if the data are used for research purposes in, in, in a in a machine learning environment. Well, there's a lot of talk about hot from hospital to home, and you started to touch on that, and I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But LaBeouf, your company focuses on developing some of the solutions uh, for this, and you're kind of there. Talk a little bit about what you've seen, what you see in wearables, and and how you're facilitating that movement out of the hospital into the home as well. All right. So it, it's really interesting. Vail, about I guess about roughly about five years ago. Uh, Valence Cell started getting a lot of inbounds from medical device brands on how to essentially make medical wearables. And, and most of those use cases, maybe not most of them, but a lot of them focused on digital therapeutics. And so Valence Cell, we started in the consumer space for exercise and sports. But as time has gone on, we've, we've gotten more into the medical space because, because of some of these use cases. So, for example, uh, one, I'll, I'll give an example of a, a non-hypertension use case. And then I'll give an example of one that, that is a hypertension-oriented use case. So uh, our technology, for example, is being used by a company that has developed a, uh, it's a digital therapeutic by, by the definition that was given that uses a wearable. And we see a lot, it's going to be harder, I think, to see the difference between digital therapeutics and wearables as time goes on. One, one of the, their wearables, a leg band, it uses our technology to track the heart rate variability. And they have developed an algorithm based off that data we provide to predict when you're about to wet the bed. And they use this for childhood and uresis. So they can tell if, you, if the child's about to piss in the bed and wake them up before they do, which is better than the technologies today where the child's already wet the bed and then you wake them up. And, and so this, the, you can see now that they can use this, this software to monitor the person and provide this therapy. And, and so they have data to show in their studies that they're able to, to get children out of this situation fast and, and they're on their way, they have the product in the marketplace today and, and they're, they're on their growth path. The, in the hypertensive case, it's interesting because, you know, it's, it's kind of some of the things you were talking about, John, the, these wearable devices today, even the ones that don't directly measure blood pressure, provide biomarkers that can be used to give a gauge for how this condition is progressing. But the challenge is that the FDA doesn't recognize those biomarkers. So you have to, you have to use those biomarkers for the use case. So there's been a lot of discussion in the marketplace, for example, for companies that, that maybe can't tell you your blood pressure with their wearable technology, but can tell you differences or trends. Uh, and that's good, that's a lower hanging fruit. The, the challenge though is then you have to prove to the FDA how you're gonna use that to treat the hypertensive use case. So that's one of the reasons why Valencell has, has picked focusing on actually providing a real accurate number. 
And uh, now, yeah, that's going to take me down a path because you, you bring up a really interesting point, consumer versus medical devices. As, as you know, and, and I mentioned, I, I worked on real medical pulse oximeters at non and medical, the kind that you go into the hospital, they'll clip onto your finger and you'll be utilizing. Um, obviously, some of you are probably wearing phones that say, well, that's no big deal. I can put my thumb on my camera on my phone or I have a watch or whatever it is and it'll it'll do what I need. And it gives me pulse. Just what I need it. Yeah. Pulse, ox pulse rate, oxygen, and that sort of thing. But the key thing is those work really well in an environment on, where you don't really need it. If you're elderly, if you're chronic suffer, uh, COPD sufferer, if you have uh, palsy and motion, all those sorts of things will throw it off. If you don't know, if your watch isn't pressed exactly against your skin, it doesn't work. So I can't use that information in a clinical environment because I'm not sure how I'm gathering it. So one of the challenges for wearables, and I'll use the Apple Watch as another example, because uh, you know they, they talked about their ECG ability and, and AFib detection and all of that. But if you read the intended use statement, it says, you, know, you go through this long list, you know, you can do this, you can do that, you, and, and you can understand AFib. But by the way, if you have AFib, don't use this to monitor it. So they're being very careful about crossing that line on using it but for But that's the exact purposes. use case where you provide public health value. So uh, that's one of the challenges. Yeah. It, it, it is. And that's that's been one of the interesting challenges for wearables, building a viable business case for it. I want to come back. To, we'll come back to this a little bit further. But I, I wanted to go to something now. Now, John, you talked about moving out of the hospital into the home. You're gathering this data and, and pulling it together. And in our pre-meeting, we talked about getting that information information in useful fashion. So if I have a magic device out there that can gather all of this, how does it become useful to you as a clinician? Right. So one of the problems that we face at Boston Medical Center and probably at most health centers is that uh, people are somewhat siloed and they're interconnected by the electronic medical records. So a patient may have multiple providers caring for them, looking at their blood pressure. And if one of their clinicians has them monitoring blood pressure at home, for example, uh, that blood pressure may be known to the clinician. But if it's not somehow integrated and doesn't appear in the electronic medical record that everybody is using, then it's invisible to all the other people that are making decisions about what to do with this person's blood pressure. And so, you know, if you, you asked, what, what do I envision to be like the way to go? So I think if there were... Um, you know, blood pressure devices that a patient could wear that would monitor blood pressure, I mean, ideally 24 seven and have those blood pressures talk to a cloud, the cloud is talks to the electronic medical record and is integrated so that all clinicians are on the same page and not using a blood pressure measured the wrong way in one, one location, measured the right way in another location and changes being made sort of haphazardly based on sometimes the wrong information, sometimes the right information. And so if everybody's seeing the same thing and the measurement is correct and is what we should be using to manage patients, that would be an ideal situation. So I need devices that are accurate and, and have you know real data that I can trust. Correct, Steve, absolutely. And, and LaBeouf, you want to talk about the connectivity piece because that data sitting out in somebody's home or written in a log somewhere or captured somewhere isn't any good until I get it somewhere. Do you want to talk about connectivity a little bit further? Well, you know, one of the, I got to say that Valence Cell, we usually don't have to deal with that directly because we don't make the final wearable device. We make the technology that goes in it. But I'll tell you this, the, the biggest pain in my ass in the whole company of Valenzel is Bluetooth. God help anybody who has to make a Bluetooth-oriented product that has to somehow get into you know, the, the, the records. Uh, but, but getting it in the records the right way ends up being really important. So you have this awesome device that can't get the data in the right spot, well, then forget about it. It begs for a comment, so I got to, I've got to comment on that. You're right. Bluetooth can be a, a royal pain, but on the other hand, one of the biggest advances I've seen, short of in in my 30 plus year uh, career in med devices, is going from beaming images back to Bethesda and Walter Reed using military communication systems to a decade ago using the first Bluetooth connected devices. One of the biggest things that has happened to med devices, other than chips and shrinking size and doing all of that, has been leveraging consumer technology and communications technology, whether it's Bluetooth, 
cellular, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, all of those things within the hospital are, are incredibly valuable and, and we're leveraging them. On the other hand, you're right. It's not for the casual person to play with. Getting Bluetooth right for the use case becomes really important. Uh, exactly. And, and for many, we're going on tangent here, but I'll just finish the thought. That's one of the challenges when you look at building devices and getting them to communicate. Some people want them to communicate directly. That's the easy way, put cellular connectivity into it, but it's expensive and time consuming and a pain. Almost everything will come with Bluetooth, but then what do you have it talk to? If it talks to your phone, then your phone may become an integral part of the device. If you're counting on it to go somewhere, calculate something and send it back to you, and your mother forgot to plug in her phone, or it's off, or if she's outside cellular connectivity, how do you manage that? So this isn't a game for the faint of heart uh, in, in, in that sense. So we've, got, we've, we've talked about devices a bit. We've talked about getting the information back so you can look at it and, and do something with it. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about hypertension and, and where we're going with that because you use medications today, you use behavior management, you have a variety of techniques that you want to explore. So John, I'm going to go back to you and talk to us about hypertension. You mentioned blood pressure and what you want to measure and some of the other parameters, but talk to us a little bit more about your ideal world if I had this wearable environment with the information? What would you gather and what would you do? So an ideal world would be a, like I you know touched upon earlier, a device that will accurately measure blood pressure 24 seven. And maybe it measures other things as well. Maybe it measures heart rate, maybe it measures pulse oximetry, uh, heart rhythm. But for hypertension, a, because there are a variety of ways to measure blood pressure. There's a variety of ways to do it in the clinic. Um, and there's wrong ways and there's right ways to do it in the clinic. And even if you're doing it the right way in the clinic, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's your blood pressure when you're not in the clinic because many patients have a white coat effect. So we are looking to home blood pressure. So right now, clinically, we can do, we can have patients purchase home blood pressure monitors and ask them to measure their blood pressure a couple times a day or a couple times a week, we can do what is now considered the gold standard for blood pressure measurement, which is 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, where there's a device that you wear, it's, it's a, a box that you wear on your belt and it connects through a hose to a blood pressure cuff and it goes off every half an hour roughly during the day and an hour roughly at night. Um, there are some questions about its accuracy uh, particularly at night because it, you know, it makes noise and it squeezes your arm in the middle of the night. But that is what we are considering the gold standard. However, these 24-hour uh, monitors are expensive, so, uh, and the software is very expensive, so clinics that take care of patients with hypertension almost uniformly don't have these. And so if you want your patient to get a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor, it's very difficult because there may not be any place in geographic you know, range where you can get this done. So if there was a way to measure 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure th through something that somebody's wearing on their wrist or on their finger and have that 24-hour ambulatory, ambulatory blood pressure seven days a week being continuously monitored, that's, and if, it, if that is an accurate blood pressure, that's really what we should be treating upon, based upon uh, in terms of managing patients with hypertension. You know, as once said, for those of us who play in the chronic space, and I've done a lot in COPD and, and, and pulse ox measurements and, and things like that, and measuring breathing, sleep apnea, and that sort of thing, the way we treat chronic diseases today is like driving and only looking at the road uh, every couple of weeks. At, that's at, how I drive. Oh, well, you've got a car that will probably take care of that in the future for you. But in, in general, that's what we happen. You, you get a six-month follow-up on a, a lab test that tells you whether your meds are working or, you know, a, a blood pressure test that's questionable when you go in. So that's, that's a promise of monitoring and wearable devices. And, and we've got a ways to go, and we'll talk about barriers in a little bit. Well, you know, in, in the, the fantasy uh, situation you described, the 24-hour monitoring, that's definitely the ideal. And part of it's too, because just now, are there enough ambulatory cuffs where we're able to see some peer-reviewed studies on the benefit of knowing these swings? And uh, I don't know if you read this paper. It's, we linked it on our site at Valence Cell. There was a study that came out a few weeks ago uh, in a peer-reviewed journal. It's escaping me right now. But what, what it showed was that it looked at when people had uh, professional blood pressure measurements done throughout time over the course of, of a few decades. 
and it said, okay, let's just pretend now that these, these readings were valid in the, in the facilities where they're at and do cumulative blood pressure. So just make a simple line connecting the dots between the blood pressure and assume that their blood pressure were raising in a linear fashion. And that was more predictive of mortality than the blood pressure, monitor, the individual blood pressure measurements themselves. And so even that simple approximation, so you can see if, even if you, if you don't have 24 seven, just getting, like you were saying, just having people measure more frequently in a way where they're likely to keep measuring it could provide a lot of value. Did you want to comment? No, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think um, the problem with frequent measurements is that people don't want to do it if they have to sit down at their kitchen table with a cuff. Um, you know, it's cumbersome. So, I but, won't but, sing the but, cumbersome song, I promise. <laughs> I want to, though. So uh, I, I think, you know, certainly there is... There are many, many studies that have shown that variability in blood pressure and the amount of time that you spend above a certain blood pressure, that those all are predictive of you know, cardiovascular events, kidney events, things like that. So people with larger variability in their blood pressure uh, tend to have more uh, chronic kidney disease, tend to have increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. So in terms of uh, these sensors ultimately being able to improve the way we risk stratify patients, I think that there is a big potential field there. So right now in the United States, we are doing risk prediction using um, what the American Cardio uh, College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, 10-year risk calculator. So you know, there is the systolic blood pressure and whether or not you're taking medication. But if you can incorporate more information um, maybe not just about sort of continuous blood pressure and variability in blood pressure, you can more finely uh, tune your risk prediction. So I'm going to talk for just a moment about it. probably one of the best chronic monitoring situations that exist today, diabetes. I mean, you know, 50 years ago plus uh, diabetes could be a death sentence. Insulin came, a treatment for it, that helped. Blood glucose measurements for anybody in the audience who's diabetic, you know, finger sticks, run, you know, and, and, and sticking the test strip in your blood and getting a measurement. It gives you a periodic look at your uh, blood sugars and what's going on there. Yet now we're still fighting. We, we now have insulin pumps that are available. We have continuous glucose monitors. So we're at the very earliest stages of being able to do something in, in one area, that of diabetes management for type 1 diabetics and do all of that. And, and it's only recently that we've had connected blood glucose monitors and we still have yet to really close the loop back to controlling anything. John, in, in your instance, when we get the information, and the example is my father was a smoker, suffered from COPD, and until I gave him a pulse oximeter, and he was a vet, they gave him oxygen, they didn't give him anything to measure that, he had no idea what was going on inside his body. And even if you have that informa information, you have to turn it into action. So with all this information you gather, what does that mean to how you manage your patients and what you're going to do? And how do you close that final loop to them to get them to do something? So um, certainly uh, having the information not just delivered to the clinician, but also delivered to the patient, I think is helpful. There have been uh, many studies, trials, comparing uh, self-measured blood pressure having patient, half the patients measure their own blood pressure, half the patients being monitored by their clinicians in the usual way, um, and having patients engaged, knowing their, their readings, as you'd mentioned with pulse oximetry, um, actually improves a number of different, it improves blood pressure control, but it, it does so in, a, in, in interesting ways. So uh, one of the major problems in uh, blood pressure management is adherence to antihypertensive medication. And um, sort of the feedback that patients get from having out of office readings and knowing what their numbers are is it actually can increase adherence and thereby increase um, blood pressure control. And so, you know, the other, and then from a, a clinician side, having sort of more accurate information will, and having everybody have access to the same accurate information will, will sort of put all of the clinicians on the same page as to what the right thing to do is. Okay. And and we talked a little bit, and I think you just were using a good case study. We said we we're going to talk about case studies a little bit too. Uh, LaBeouf, you've been talking a bit about Valencell and what you're doing and all of that. Do you want to expound on any of any of that from a perspective of, 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 of being able to capture information, put it in? And then I'll talk a little bit about a software case study as well. So do you have anything you want to add on case studies? Well, yeah. You know, at, at Valencell, we do a, 
so many re, we have so many research projects, especially on the blood pressure monitoring technology, of course. And we one of the things that was interesting for us is talking about medications is, you know, we our technology doesn't use a blood pressure cuff. So we're looking at the blood flow with light and also inertial changes in your body. So the thing about it is those dynamics could be different for people who are on blood pressure medication versus those who aren't. So we, when we were developing our, our machine learning model to connect the dots, we had to collect data from people who were explicitly on medication and people who weren't so that the model would understand how to see the difference between all those folks in order to be able to get an accurate representation of blood pressure for folks who are on medication and not. Uh, so we've had, to, we, we've had to collect data across a variety of ethnicities, a variety of body weights, a variety of ages, and a variety of vascular structures, and also folks who are both on and not on vasoactive medications. And I'm going to bring a little different slant to talk about how you gather that information. Um, as mentioned, I'm director of solutions for a company called S3 Connected Health. Um, and we're a 30-year-old company headquartered in Ireland that basically does connected devices and software. And, and we have recently come out with a hypertension uh, product that basically allows the patient at home to capture their blood pressure, report it to the clinicians, and it's CE marked in Europe. So we spent a lot of time doing that. We built a lot of collection devices for spinal muscular atrophy for children and that sort of stuff. So I want to point out there, there, there's the hardware side, there's the software side that has to come together to pull it together, and there's the clinician side. One of the things I want to hit on, so we've got pieces of technology, and it's, it's technology guys it's probably less of a technology issue now than it ever has been before, and there are other problems. So with all this cool stuff, why don't we have it in a ubiquitous fashion? Why did we have, basically, we're hyping telehealth and telemedicine because of the pandemic. It did a great thing for Zoom for Doctors. It allowed us all to have appointments and talk to people, but it arguably didn't improve healthcare in, 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 in any fashion. So, so John, let's start with you. What's, what prevents you from taking advantage of all of this great technology and putting it all together? You've touched on it a bit. It's got to get into the EMR, so you've got to collect it and be able to see it. But what else, from your perspective, keeps you from buying all our cool technology? Um, I think, you know, having it be accurate and FDA approved is a critical step. I mean, I think... Uh, you know, there are certain standards for whether a blood pressure uh, measurement device is uh, valid from different organizations, but I mean, you, you would also get a different read from if you asked clinicians, would they accept a blood pressure that's off by a certain uh, amount? Um, so I think accuracy of uh, the technology is, is going to be key. Um, also, whether it's accurate in all situations, all ages, whether somebody's, you know, going for a walk, whether they're in a meeting, whether they're sleeping, all of the accuracy is, is paramount. Um, but then, as you said, having the information being visible um, and rather than invisible is, is also a, a, a huge issue. LaBeouf, from your perspective, the technology is certainly a key part of that. What are some of the hurdles that you see? Well, I think that for us, um, focusing on, you know, that saying, who the hell said that saying, begin with the end in mind? There's some dude, he wrote a book about it, I can't remember. But thinking about the, the, end, the end product, the real solution that you want. Because, you know, if you're going to make a medical claim, it's, the FDA is going to have to regulate it. They're going to have to. And, and you need to make the medical claim that they will accept for that use case. And so one of the things that was a challenge for wearables companies for a while is the FDA kind of didn't know what to do about wearable companies. And, but fortunately, because of some of the efforts by companies much larger than Valencell, that, that started to change. You know, when we submitted our information to the FDA about our product, we were surprised by how much they knew about the problem and how, how to explain to us the testing that needed to be done to get to the right end. So, so the, the, the regulatory challenge is one that comes to my mind right now. The good news is if you're, if you're making a wearable product, I would not be scared of the FDA. They, they are uh, really behaving in the right way to get these products out there, the right way, such that they are accurate for the intended use. 
Yeah, and, and that's a key point. Those of us in the med device side love to blame the FDA, but they are doing a, a good job on starting to learn about monitoring software, about wearables and about those things and differentiating so that you can really trust the information coming in. And, and that is absolutely critical. So regulatory is has historically been a challenge. I'll suggest something else in addition, which is the, the reimbursement. It's, it's always a question of follow the money. Uh, if you aren't getting reimbursed for, for your hardware or your software, you, might as, you could have the greatest idea, but if you don't think about how you're going to get paid for it, and unfortunately in the U.S. today, we have a reimbursement system that says you have to show its efficacy, you have to show all of this. Uh, uh, John, you're smiling already, so you must have something to say about the, the payment side of this as well and the reimbursement. Go ahead. Well, well, no, I mean, I was, I was thinking as you were talking about that, about how this type of technology could eventually replace the blood pressure machines that we use, you know, in the clinics and in the hospitals and how, or in the clinics at least, and how that actually may be save, saving money for the clinic because they don't have to have, um, you know, the, you know, purchase new machines after they break down. I suppose, you know, there's a certain, there's cost to the wearable technology as well. Um, but in terms of measuring blood pressure in the clinic and reimbursing, it's part of the physical exam. You know, it's a vital sign. And so when we uh, measure vital signs, um, you know, in terms of reimbursement purposes, uh, you know, it, it, that's part of the physical exam and it goes into our billing. In terms of uh, telemedicine and what we've done in the pandemic, it's... Um, you know, there, there are uh, ways of billing for telemedicine visits that are different than me, uh, billing for in-person visits. At the, the moment at our hospital, we're not billing as much for telemedicine visits, but I think, um, you know, I, I think from a, uh, a clinical perspective and from a clinician perspective, having accurate and reliable and um, readings that are that we should be using rather than inaccurate readings actually could be, you know, it would be accepted by clinicians and I think, you know, could ultimately uh, save money in terms of, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease events in terms of the equipment that the hospitals and the clinics have to maintain. And, and you made a key point. Those changes in regulations that came about because of the, the, the problems of COVID not being able to go in until the regulations changed. I mean, uh, the, the American Telemedicine Association was founded in 1993, right after that, DICOM and all of that. And they thought, we're, this is going to be good. And, and 30 years later, we're still having the same conversations about where we're going to do these. When the rules changed to allow reimbursement for telemedicine visits, for having us Zoom call in as opposed to go in, that made a huge difference because the doctors and hospitals were getting reimbursed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because if I, before that, if I had called a patient and asked me, asked them to read me their home blood pressure readings over the phone, I wasn't billing for that visit. Whereas now if I'm doing that, I can bill for that. Right. And, and so it's, and rightly so, it's still about the money and getting, and getting paid for that. We need to continue those regulations. Then we run into other things like licensure, in, in if you're not licensed in a particular state and you're reading blood pressure for someone across a border that you're not licensed in, that presents some problems. So there's a infrastructure and, and a piece that goes along with all of this that prevents us from implementing it. And, you know, um, I'll suggest as well that the infrastructure uh, in terms of how hospitals are run, how clinics are run, and what happens today is an impediment as technologists that keep some of those advances from going on. And, and we, we, we won't fix that here. But do uh, you guys have anything else to add on some of the barriers? Because let's talk about key takeaways and then leave us some time for questions from the audience. Uh, any, any other thoughts on some of the barriers that keep us from really using this? Well, I mean, I think, you know, accuracy is the first step, yep. right? Um, then once you have that, there's, uh, I guess, other barriers, matter of uh, sort of patient engagement, patient acceptance, and, you know, affordability for patients, whether the clinics end up helping with that or not. Um, and then, you know, for large healthcare centers, sort of having the non-clinical people uh, sign off, um, you know, sometimes when you try to change things in a large health center, uh, there are certain barriers that, um, both time barriers and, you know, inertial barriers that you have to overcome. Um, but I think that those are overcomable, yeah. if that's a real word. What, 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 oh, go ahead. Yeah, I feel that for, for the longest time, there was a huge technical barrier to measuring blood pressure without a cuff. I feel that we've overcome that at Valencell 
painfully with thousands and thousands and thousands of data sets we've collected. And, and, and now the barrier really is to get through the regulatory hurdles. But I want to say those regulatory hurdles are the right hurdles. I mean, they, we, they, you don't want to just – those the, – the, 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 the rules that are being imposed upon us by the FDA, I got to say so far, are all the right rules. And I hope that they continue doing this with everyone else who's trying to get through this process also. Yep. L let me add one, one other thought or uh, speculation on this as well. Because one of the problems, even if I had a perfect blood pressure measuring system in the world and, and had that in place, what – is going to happen with the, the issue of fusion of the, all of that information. Because today, if, if I have a diabetic system and I'm chasing that, I have one company's set of information I can gather. I can buy a system from Omron today that will pull in a certain set of information. I will have lab tests that come from Quest and, and we'll have that together. So we're kind of at a point where I can have five or six different information streams that all have to feed together. What about standards? What about that sent data fusion when we can really bring all those pieces together? John, any thoughts? I mean, I think that that's the issue with, uh, you know, all these different measurements uh, in silos and clinicians in silos. And I think, you know, if there was a device that did all of this, you know, terrific. Um, but I think that the, the, it, the, the barrier is going to be if you have information on blood glucose, on blood pressure, on heart rate, heart rhythm, having all of those sort of talk to what the clinicians are looking at on a day-to-day -day basis um, and having all the information in one place to sort of merge the silos, I think, is uh, the way to go. Okay, so let's... Uh Key takeaways, uh, John, we'll, we'll, we'll finish, we'll, we'll take that with you because you've talked about uh, being able to trust the information and have accuracy and all that sort of stuff. For the audience here, any key takeaways on digital therapeutics and where you see it going and what's happening and your, your last parting thought before we go into question and answer mode? Yeah, so I think um, maybe I'll go back to one of the things I said at the very beginning, which is that we as a healthcare system in the United States, around the world, it's the same. Uh, we are not measuring blood pressure in the right way, but we are making decisions for our patients based on inaccurate information. And so we need out-of-office measurements. We need accurate out-of-office measurements, and we need it to be more accessible. And so I think that whatever can be done to push us in that direction is going to be very beneficial. Okay, thank you. I like Blow that up. takeaway. I'm going to drop, drop the mic for you right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and I guess from from my perspective, this is this is great. I think the technology exists. We've seen evidence of it. There's a, certainly a need to pull the information together. And as somebody who's been banging on this for thirty plus years, it's it's nice to see what's happening in the medical world today. We're going to conquer some some things and pull it together for chronic measurements that we haven't been able to do before. But we still have a lot of of barriers. Once I get that information, and we haven't touched on it a whole lot, but I'll leave you to think about it. It's it's you turn data, I get a bunch of stuff coming in and no doctor in the world wants to see that information 24 seven, 365. They wanna see the key elements of that. And so we'll be talking about AI or machine learning or something that makes it usable f for you. We'll pull that data together, we turn it into information in some magical fashion, which today is somebody, a, a, a talented person such as yourself looking at it and interpreting it. Information then has to turn into action, get that patient to make a change. My father, it's get him to understand his blood oxygen level when he used a pulse oximeter and geez, this is why I feel crappy in the morning and, and, and play that game all day. And finally, finally turn it into outcomes. So from the device to outcomes is where we need to go. And I'm gonna leave you guys with that thought. We have plenty of time for questions. I think Lori's got a microphone, so if you'll raise your hand and, and uh, ask the question, and you can ask it generally or target it towards one of us, we'll do our best to answer. I'm gonna target this to Dr. Foreman. What is the definition of accurate? So um, that's a very good question. And I think if you uh, ask that question of different organizations, uh, you get a different answer. So, you know, no, no, correct uh, me if I'm wrong. Uh, 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 uh. oh. No, you're cheating. Oh, me. You're cheating. Um, by accurate, if I took my blood pressure measurement right now, yep. would that be an accurate reading? Uh, it depends. If a medical professional just took my blood pressure measurement right now, mm -hmm. would that be an accurate reading? I well, would submit to you that it is not. 
Okay. Because I would think an accurate blood pressure measurement would be what is the trend over some period of time? Because you don't know what happened to me before I just sat down here and the effect that's going to have on my blood pressure. I, I agree with you. So we should be treating people's sort of usual blood pressure, not what their blood pressure is at any instant. So you asked, the question is, if I measured your blood pressure right now, would it be an accurate reading? It would certainly give, if I had a device that was accurate, an oscillometric device that was accurate, it would give me your instantaneous blood pressure, it would be accurate. If I had somebody walk in and put a cuff on your arm, pumping up, use a stethoscope, and let the, you know, the column drop very, very quickly, even though that's an instantaneous blood pressure, it is not an accurate blood pressure. It is not what your blood pressure is at that moment. So you need a proper measurement, but I totally agree with you that you know, your blood pressure right now may not be your usual blood pressure, and we should be m managing your usual blood pressure, which again is why we want out-of-office readings, and we don't want just one out-of-office reading, we want multiple out-of-office readings, because you go into clinic, and you're nervous, you had a hard time with traffic, you had a hard time parking, you go up the elevator, you walk right in because you're five minutes late, and then you get your blood pressure taken. That's not what we should be treating, and I totally agree with you. Uh, I, and I'm not gonna ask a question, but we're not really taking advantage of a wearable, because with a wearable, you can get continuous readings over a, per a period of time, and I don't think anybody's taking advantage of that, that's all. Well, but there's a, I'll jump in on that because you'll get continuous readings, but again, the, the question is, the question is the context of those readings. I built pulse oximeters, which would give you pulse rate and blood oxygen level. Those changed a lot, and depending on what I, snapshot I took, they were accurate. I trusted them, but unless I had the context around it, I, was I exercising? Had I been watching a scary movie? Uh, had I been jogging up a hill? It's the same contextual questions he has around blood pressure I would have around pulse ox that we would have around almost any of the, of the parameters we measure for vital signs. Breathing, rapid breathing. And that's where I think the real importance of having accurate wearables that will give you multiple information feeds so that it becomes useful. So that we could tell him that that blood pressure was measured after somebody just climbed a set of steps or something like that. So it's the context of being able to do it. A single wearable doesn't help you a lot with that. So w w one question and comment took us down a, a whole five minute conversation. Next. Oh, okay, um, I have to prefix my question with I'm a big fan of the product and my cardiologist is in one of their commercials, but it seems like the gold standard is the Cardia, not exactly a blood pressure device, but for EKGs, it saved me from having to go to the emergency room. I could attach my EKG to an email to my cardiologist. He took a look at it. And to me, that was really the goal of excellent kind of home health care and monitoring. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, C Cardia, Cardia is a good, uh, LiveCore is the company that makes that product, of course. And they're an example of a company that I actually feel is doing it right. Because, you know, to the point earlier, when Apple launched their AFib detector, God bless them. I'm glad they helped blast that through the FDA. But they, they, they arguably may have caused some public health uh, negative outcomes because they focused it on people who didn't have AFib. So now, every time it tells you you have AFib, when you don't, you're going to the doctor, you're spending money, they're spending money, and that's raising up the cost for everybody in healthcare. But but the Cardia product focuses on people who have AFib. And so it is providing public health value in terms of improving health at lower cost. So I really like the approach they're taking, focusing on, uh, for lack of a better term, disease populations or people who are, are managing a, an illness or disease. Yeah, I, I agree. I was going to jump on that. I've been using the AliveCore device. Mine is so old that it uh, the case that it came How out How old is it? For my iPhone 4, I think it was, is, is now kind of decomposed. Not because I had AFib, but because I'm a technology guy and so played with it. And I could do exactly that. It is the right kind of device. But it's a single lead ECG system. It doesn't do what a three lead, five lead, 12. No, it's got two connections. It's a single. But it's one lead. Yeah, it's one lead. Yeah. So, but but it, it's a great example. I agree. It's the right kind of device in the in the right place. 
but it's still kind of a one trick pony. It measures AFib, but I don't get all the other information that could go along with it and give me a much better picture of you. But it's probably one of the best and certainly one of the oldest examples of, of a, a, a semi wearable type device. And Omron's one of the investors, and Omron's a leader in blood pressure monitoring. So my fantasy would be somehow, whether it's our technology, Omron's, or somehow, this could be integrated into a device where you can get all that information at the same time. Yeah, and, and, and one of the real challenges there to, to that point, who's the, who are the medical data collectors of the future? Is it Google, is it Apple, is it you know, Amazon? I sure as I don't want Google with knowing all my stuff. Uh, it could be, but it's pulling all that information together and getting to the point where medical professionals can take a look at it. And right now today, the, the vacuum for information tends to be some of those big companies who are doing some interesting things in that space, and we never really touched on that. Next question. Other questions, comments? Somebody's got to have something. We, we love to argue. <laughs> Anyone? Jump in. Anything else? Come on, we got an hour. Oh, I'm kidding. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so when we look at wearables and we look at where they are right now, how did um, COVID-19 impact where we are with wearables. Did it kind of accelerate it? I know it accelerated telehealth, but just wondering how it impacts. I tell yeah. you, boy, do we have a story on that. So the most, of, as I was mentioning earlier, most of our customers traditionally have been on the consumer side, so sports and fitness. When COVID hit, our inbounds all shifted towards folks who are trying to find a way to get blood pressure and other biometrics into remote patient monitoring. So there, there are... Oh, good Lord. I, I, I got to say right now, maybe definitely over 100 startups that uh, startup companies, even startups within large companies that 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 have come to our company building wearables for this remote patient monitoring concept that was spawned from COVID-19. And, and I'll add to that as well. Um, I think it's drawn a lot of attention. And it's certainly pulled a lot in. There are a lot of people who come to it and say, I've got this great idea for I'm going to measure this or that or the other. Uh, pulse oximeters, where I spent a bunch of time, for example, using something standard, they couldn't buy enough parts to ship as many pulse oximeters. There are people buying pulse oximeters who had no idea what they were, you know, uh, a year and a half ago. And, and, and buying some questionable ones out there, too, that don't work very well, by the way. Um, one of the things I see, because I, I do a lot of consulting in the wearables business, and one of the things that happens is people get a great idea. Then they look at and realize how hard it is to commercialize those things. Because if you really want to use it for medical, uh, for a real medical reason, you need to show proof that it works, that it does what it, it says it's going to. You have to go through the FDA. You have to deal with Bluetooth. You have to get the information out. It, it's find a good partner who can help you do that. And, and and to get it done. I mean, John, you, we left you out of the conversation here. Anything you want to add to, to uh, that? No, I don't, nothing. Ne next question. question. So a lot of interest, but it didn't move the needle from a new technology that solves something very quickly yet. Uh, Follow-up question? Uh, and going forward, when we deal with wearables, should we look at it as more of... Um, are you looking at it as more of consumer based or patient based? Because there's this whole huge argument now that patients are now becoming consumers with the availability of all these wearables and what they can do. The doctor is becoming the middleman, so to speak, or the middle woman, so to speak. I'm going to feed that to John for a very real reason because. I lived in the consumer world where, where a lot where they did as well as in the pulse ox with a medical grade device that worked and all of that. But let's go back to John's question or point on what he can do with that information because Fitbit got sued because somebody was trying to use it as a heart rate monitor and there's a suit out there because they're not heart rate monitors that are accurate. So John, go for it. Yeah, so I mean, I. I I think that the information, so you're talking about uh, uh, patients as consumers, and um, I think that, you know, wearable technology that works is going to be welcome to the clinician. Um, so, for example, Cardia, I think, is probably welcome to your cardiologist 
who then doesn't need to necessarily have an appointment with you to make sure to monitor your AFib. And so I think that there is, um, you know, this would be uh, something valuable to clinicians provided that they're not being bombarded with inaccurate or unreliable information. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that, that certainly uh, clinicians would be adopters of this if it uh, somehow if it worked, if it was integrated and uh, was providing them with information that was useful. That they, that they can trust. And that's part of the reason why we know that's why we've gone down the FDA path for this so that the value you can trust, that that's the same value you would get if you took a blood pressure cuff reading the right way. I have a question. Does it really matter if something's FDA approved like Fitbit, if all you're looking at is a trend? If you're looking at a trend on Fitbit and something changes, there's a delta, can't you just go to the doctor then? Does it really matter? Well, no, 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 no. I'm looking at the doctor. Oh, uh, you're looking at me. Okay, so uh, is is the change accurate? It's a change. Well, however you define accurate, we're getting back to accurate again. Right. So, so, so I. That's why you go to the doctor, Doctor Foreman. I yes. noticed a change on my Fitbit. Can you just check me out? Is that information valuable? Um, potentially, I would say potentially. So if you, if your Fitbit is telling you what your blood pressure is and any change in what your Fitbit, um, tells you is actual real change as opposed to the device, not, um, you know, giving you accurate information. If it's not, then your visit to me and the healthcare dollars spent are not worthwhile. If the change that your Fitbit is telling you is occurring is actually reflective of a change, then, you know, yes, that's potentially valuable. And, does it and matter? Does it matter? It, does, if, it's, if, it's ac if it's accurate or not, does it really yeah, matter? Well, but if, it, I sends, if it makes me run to your office, does it matter? Um, it does matter if it's accurate because even if, so, so it depends on, um, you know, so there's, there's accurate, accuracy and precision. So if your monitor, if your Fitbit is always 10 millimeters mercury lower, right, than your actual blood pressure. If it's always that, then that, that change that you've noticed is valuable. But how do we know that it's always, every time you use your Fitbit to measure your blood pressure, that it's exactly 10 millimeters lower than your actual blood pressure? So maybe ambient changes in your body, maybe something you ate, maybe something, you know, you did earlier in the day or had a drink of alcohol or something like that. Who knows? I, I don't know. I'm not involved on the tech side. But, but you know, what if some sort of ambient change uh, caused your Fitbit to tell you that your blood pressure was different and it wasn't? What about if I calibrated my Fitbit during an office visit to your equipment? Uh, as a technical, let me challenge the, the technical side to, to his point. Unless the device has been built to be reliable and easily usable and a lot of things that go into us building a medical device, it becomes a, a real challenge. So we don't know that the users, and this goes into our designing products that are usable at home. Um, is it easy to use? Are you using it in the right way? If you're wearing a watch, do you have it cinched down to your wrist in the white right in the right fashion, so it's tight. Is it loose? Is your skin sweaty? There's a lot of conditions that technically impact making sure that data is correct, that when we're designing and building a medical device, we pay a lot of attention to. He's gotta be able to trust that information when it comes in. He needs to know that it's, this, it's the same information over and over and over. And that's a very hard thing to do. And that's a challenge for us who design medical devices to do that, so. You're bringing up some good points, and trend is important if you can trust the trend. I just have a medical device, so I'm asking you some yeah. questions. So, any, we any, probably have time for one more quick question. Anything else? Uh, we've got a couple back here. Bill? Uh, yep. Thank you for the interesting panel conversation, everyone. Um, so my question is, how far away do you think we are from combining multiple physiological measurements or other orthogonal data sets? Um, maybe not for a diagnosis, but as a sort of a digital biomarker for an early warning sign. You know, to the points that were mentioned earlier, 
uh, and actually this is right in, in your forte. Uh, I'll say so. The, if you if you if you have accurate digital biomarkers that are consistent to to Foreman's point, uh, well, I don't think we're that far away because there there are companies that are focused on it, doing exactly that, as long as the data that goes in ain't garbage. And and I'll add to that. I, I work routinely with um, big companies and small companies. I worry about the small companies who are doing one measurement because it's important, it's interesting, but until it gets into the EMR, it's, it's basically like writing it on a post-it note. It's not useful. I think there are big companies, the big med device companies are starting to look at it, and then they're, they're pulling together renal information and acute care information and you know lab work and all of that. There's starting to be an awareness that that's important, but I'll, I'll say it's slower than the technology would likely enable. And part of that is back to a point I think Dr. Foreman made, getting somebody who can interpret all those streams of information you're involved in hypertension, so you're really good at looking at certain things. But if I asked you to look at the, you, you know, my my levels uh, associated with blood glucose, you probably know a bit about it, but you're probably not an expert. So how do we pull that information together? What's the overwhelming financial reason that that somebody's going to really look at it? So that, thinking thinking about the use case is important too. Did I just cut you off? No. So so uh, you ever heard of this company called Cardiogram? Small company, small outfit. Uh, they they started their company with this idea of can I take data from wearable devices, heart rate, uh, footsteps, uh, some, and those basic things that come off wearable devices today, and use that to make some diagnostic diagnostic uh, estimation about are you hypertensive or are you pre diabetic or or might you be diabetic, and they they were able to show that they could make those predictions. Now one of the challenges was they weren't able to make them good enough for the use case. So they weren't able to make the predictions well enough to where you'd be making a public, you'd be providing public health value and not adding to cost. So, so, so the, if they had additional metrics they could pull off the device besides heart rate, besides step rate, some other parameters, maybe breathing rate, maybe others, maybe they could improve that precision to where they could do those. It's good enough for the use case. So, John, to, to build on that question, so we pull all that information together for you. Some magical company builds a device, pulls it all together, which I would suggest is technically doable. What's that happen when it comes into a, a, a medical center, and how would you handle it? Well, I think today that would be uh, managed in silos. So you would have the same device, um, you know, measuring five different things and bringing it all into, you know, the hospital's EMR. You still have me looking at the blood pressure, the endocrinologist looking at the glucose, the cardiologist looking at the heart rhythm. So you have, you know, siloed sort of uh, specialized care in a major health center. Obviously, these types of things, you know, depending on where you are living and where you're getting your care may be all managed by the same person. And so I think sort of um, model management algorithms or management models could be useful pulling all this information in uh, to help clinicians where to help situations where you're not going to have like uh, five subspecialists looking at at your 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 issues. You have one more back there, or you want to cut it? I'll oh, go ahead. One more, yeah. and then we're done. Uh, All right, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Luigi. I'm from Italy. Uh, before asking the question, I'd like to say that after ten years of not sleeping well, the doc the only doctor that diagnosed my sleep apnea was a Garmin Phoenix S. Uh, X6, something like this. So to answer the question about does it need to be a medical device, I think that when you look at trends, uh, they can give important indications, even if you're, they're not medical devices. But my question was different. I was involved with an Italian startup delivering not a wearable, but a very portable device that people could uh, keep at home and in two minutes was giving very important vitals like blood pressure, ECG, uh, oxygen saturation and so on. Um, the problem I found in the commercialization was not really technical about reliability, not even regulatory, but was what to do with all those data. I was talking with the CEO of the company. I would say, what do you expect? That the family doctor of all these people in the evening when they're watching TV with their wives, they would go online and check if somebody has uploaded everything. 
how does it work that these data are going to be actually used in a practical manner? So the question is, don't you find that this piece is as important as reliability, accuracy, and precision? Right, so it's a, it's a good question. And again, you know, if you have all this information, the question is, uh, how, what are you gonna do about it? Particularly if you don't have the expertise exactly in what to do with all of these pieces of information. And so I think, um, you know, to help with, uh, you know, a, sort of a family physician or an internist who is managing with the, these patients and the, this information, um, you know, without the help of specialists or other experts, I think, um, you know, having some sort of resource that's beyond just, okay, here's the data. Um, having uh, clinical algorithms, having some sort of support that goes along with the, with, a, with the device to help management in certain situations. So, I mean, that's part of, that's part of what UpToDate does. You know, I mentioned UpToDate okay. at the very beginning is a, you know, a resource that, you know, any clinician around the world can potentially use and has information on managing, you know, information on, you know, arrhythmias and glucose measurements and diabetics and blood pressure and people with hypertension. So th is, if there is a, a sort of a clinical decision support tool that goes along with the data that's coming in, I think that that would be uh, useful. The, the simple analogy is when I use the cardio device, if I'm monitoring my heart or something like that, it, the doctor wants to know a half hour before I'm going to have my heart attack that I've got a problem. So they can tell me to take an aspirin and they'll call the ambulance. And for 30 days afterwards, because they have to monitor me for readmission and penalties and that sort of stuff. So we need clinical decision support tools that monitor all of that in order to really make it useful. I'm getting the, the sign to cut things off. Thank you all very much. It was a great conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you.